So last... Am I on? So last week, there were some disgruntled people in the audience. Oh, he talks too much. Oh, he goes on and on and on. Well, let me tell you one thing. This show is about me, what I'm interested in, what my thoughts are on the world, and it's only about what I find interesting. And it's my outlet to vent. So you're going to deal with it, and you're going to listen, and you're going to enjoy it. And if you have a problem with it, I have a spot right here on my ass waiting for you. So pucker up. Brian has spots on his ass. I do have a spot. I've been saving it for you. Trust me. All week. This is River Talk. This is the Brian Crawford show where I say whatever the hell I want. And you're going to like it. It's the River's Edge Radio Network broadcasting 24 hours a day at riversedgepgh.com. Pittsburgh's voice for local music. We've got Gabe Reed who will be in studio here and he's going to be playing for us and talking to us in a bit. I have Michael Cohen with me as well, who just came off of a big comedy show. Yeah. How did that go? Killed it last night. Uh, Yeah, no, I I booked my first, uh, I produced my first show, uh, Laugh Riot, at the Roboto Project. We packed the venue. Uh, Everyone got paid. Life is good. That's awesome. We'll be doing it again in March, April, May, and June. Fantastic. I, I wanted to go to that as well as a friend's party and, and everything else. But this is where I go in and I, and I talk a little bit about my life. I, I work overnight, as you know. I have that shitty, shitty job. Uh, where I, I got threatened this week, actually, at work. And, and that's a whole situation I don't even want to get into on air because it's still being investigated. <laughs> But you know, you go to work and you can't even you can't even get through the work day without being threatened. I'm a zombie all the time. And then Saturday, I try to stay awake because it's my day off, and it's happened twice in a row now where I've completely passed out at 6 p.m. And this time, I even set my alarm to sleep for an hour, and I slept walked over to the alarm, turned it off, and went back to bed. Well. Then, like I said, you're you're lucky I slept because for like 14 hours. in March you'll get another chance to come out. We got Shannon Norman headlining at March 17th, also at the Roboto Project. It's gonna be a lot of fun. It's a dry venue. I didn't yes, realize that. I did. It was that, fantastic, yeah. actually. Like no one was overserved. Uh, people were just attentive. Yeah, yeah. It's delightful. A, it's a dry really. venue. It's a community run. Yeah, theater, it's like a I d- DIY punk venue. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm wearing the Millville Music Festival shirt today. Not for any reason other than to let you know that the deadline is looming. Submissions end January 31st. We already have over 400 people who have submitted to the festival to perform, whether they're a solo performer or a musician. So uh, make sure if you want to get in on that action... What? Whether you're a solo performer or an actual musician. <laughs> a solo performer. Well, you know what? We do have other performers that aren't musicians, so we've got the straight performers. That's but true. But bands or musicians, yes. We have Aaron Anthony, who is in studio as well. We're going to be talking to him about his race for U.S. Congress. And I'm excited. He's the, the first one that we've had in for this political campaign season. We'll be bringing other people in, I believe, throughout the the season so that's going to be fun as well and uh recently i you know i have to say as the only person in the media to stand up for bicycle safety i have to talk about a an issue that occurred in millvale where a bicycler was run over or at least run off the road he was practically run over right here on the corner of lincoln and north And what's crazy, and it was the comments that were, I think, the most stunning on Facebook, because I, I'm very fair. I I roll with an iron fist, but I'm extremely fair when I preach about equality on the roadways. I just want everyone to be held to the same standard, and I feel like because of the big bike lobby, which works to create division between those who are supposed to be sharing the road. There is still no big bike lobby. There is a huge bike lobby, and their Does agents exist. Their agents burrow <laughs> in the mayor's office, and they have his ear, and, they, and he's been using his power to create division and strife among those who are supposed to be sharing the road. But they are supposed to be sharing the road, and they should be following the rules equitably. And usually it's the motor, vehicleist, the motor vehicle drivers who are 
victim to uh, cyclist antics. But this that is time, also not true. It's Go extremely on. <laughs> true. But this time, it was the opposite. This time, a cyclist was riding this way. Another vehicle was riding down north towards Lincoln. The car was driving down north, and he goes makes a left on Lincoln. This cyclist is coming, and he just completely makes the left, runs the cyclist off the road. Actually, he hits the cyclist, who falls over and manages to get up. Thankfully, he didn't die. Uh, there was an incident also in Pittsburgh recently where, where somebody did die due to a, a collision between a vehicle and a cyclist. But this is horrible, and he just drives right off. This cyclist was following the rule. He was in the appropriate lane, and everyone on Facebook is saying that he should be on the sidewalk. But that's against the law. You're not allowed to ride a bike on yeah. the sidewalk. Oh, they would be furious if he was on the sidewalk when they were trying to use it. And it's also illegal. See, sure, I, just, too. I just want people to follow the rules. So I'm saying that this guy should be charged with, with attempted murder for running down this cyclist, and he should be thrown in jail. I mean, or at least like, dragged am, out of his house and beaten or something. Yeah. I'm an advocate for, for cyclist rights, Michael. I am the biggest advocate for cyclists <laughs> in Pittsburgh. I am the one who got that bike lane in Oakland where people are hit on a daily basis. That was me. I've been preaching about it for a year, and finally the mayor decided to listen. Instead of putting frivolous bike lanes in multiple locations, creating division, destroying two-lane roads. Your least favorite bike lane in the whole town is the one I use almost every day. Yes, and it is <laughs> destroyed traffic patterns downtown. It should be removed immediately or at least finished. At least finished. If you're going to screw up the roadways, at least finish the bike lane so it can get to the point so cyclists aren't driving. See, again, I'm, I'm caring. My heart is beating. <laughs> it's thumping outside of my, my chest at a, at a rate that has been unseen by, by many doctors. That's the coffee and the Adderall. It might have something to do with the coffee. <laughs> but the point is, is it's a death trap where it's at on Penn Avenue. It should have been finished. Instead of building bike lanes in all of these locations in these parks where there's not a lot of traffic, which I'm, I'm okay with building some of them, but not until you finish the one on Penn Avenue or at least rip it up because it never should have gone there in the first place. But right now it's a death trap. But either way, the moral of the story is I, of course, am looking out for the best interests of the cyclists as always where uh, you know this happened in Millville. If this would have happened in, in Pittsburgh – he would have turned a major road, the mayor, into a one-way street, and that would have been his solution to the problem. I, I just want people to be held accountable to the law. And it's time that the iron fist of justice come down on all people on the roadways, and everyone is held in line. I am Brian Crawford. That's Michael Cohen. This is the River's Edge Radio Network. And we have Aaron Anthony, who is going to be – he's running for Congress. And if he gets in, he's going to tackle these big issues like bike lanes. Where do you stand on the bike lane <laughs> issue, Aaron? Brian, thank you. My name is Aaron Anthony. I'm running for Congress. And I, I'm – I'm pro bike lane. I, I am. You're pro I bike lane. Are you pro? However, however, I recognize and appreciate your fairness that you approach it. It's not a uh, picking and choosing uh, favorites here. That you're you're recognizing Everybody recognizing be... a victim where it is. Do you think that cyclists <laughs> should pay insurance if they're on the roads, or maybe pay taxes towards the the maintenance of thus roads? I'm pretty sure bicyclists pay taxes, Brian. Not like the vehicle drivers do. Well, you can also consider the uh, cyclists that live within the city of Pittsburgh and those that commute from outside the city of Pittsburgh. They're paying different taxes. And, yeah, I think that there might be a commuter tax that, that could. See, there we go. go. See, I like the way yeah. this guy thinks. Yeah. So that's what I mean. It's, it's fair in, in equal. Do you think if I get into an accident and, and it's a cyclist that runs a light or runs a stop sign, as they often do, and in, in, in it ends up we get into an accident. Do you think that that cyclist should have to pay for the damages to my vehicle, my, the, my mental health issues from, from hitting an, another person? And do you think they should be forced to shine my shoe because my toe has touched <laughs> the earth? This is, this is purely the work of, of uh, the federal legislature here. I think this I has think to so. see its way all the way up. All to the way up to the top. <laughs> to the highest levels, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I really wanted to start this discussion off with a serious question. Sure. So, uh, I was thinking what was like the most hard hitting question that I could that I could roll this interview in. We've got Aaron Anthony, twelfth district, and which is spread out all over Western Pennsylvania, at least in, at least it stretches out into different areas. Uh, so the hard hitting question is is your name is Aaron Anthony. You've got two first names. Your opponent is Roths. <laughs> and he's got a very complicated name. Mm -hmm. So when the two names go head to head, 
wh- how do you think that's going to play out? You've got Rothfuss, right, and then you've got Aaron Anthony, the two first names. Sure, yeah, yeah. I hope I hope the two first names or alliteration uh, does. You think does that'll help you? Me. I sure hope so. All right, great. So now that we've got that out of the way, uh, you look like you have a question. <laughs> nope. No. Okay. So. What made you decide to run for Congress? You're, you're a musician. You, uh, you also work at the University of Pittsburgh, correct? That's right. That's right. So uh, what spurred you to decide to run? So I'm running. I'm running because I think that there's a lot uh, that is just not, not quite right in the country right now. Um, I, I was a teacher at Shaler High School before, before being an education researcher. I taught American Lit. One of the things we talk about a lot is the American dream, the American identity. What do we associate with what it means to be American? and the story that we have about our, our, our past. And inevitably, something that comes up is the idea of opportunity and the opportunity to do better than the previous generation. And that what we all want is to leave something better for the next generation. Mm-hmm. This, this time right now is something, I think, historic. That, that In the history of this country, the millennials, and I'm going to use broadly those born between 1980 and 2000. Okay. So I know there's some different definitions, but millennial generation is the first. Those born between 1980 and 2000, they're not doing as well on average as our parents at the same age. I think that's huge. That's huge. Like this has been true for 200 plus years of American history, and now something. Well, why do you has think changed. that is? Right. That's the right question. Why is it? Why is it that somebody in their mid 20s to mid 30s um, has uh, lower rates of home ownership, lower rates of employment, lower rates of uh, or higher rates of, of, of poverty and all the, altogether just lower income than our parents at the same age. I think there's a lot of stability that has been there for previous generations that those basic footholds in life, the things that you need to kind of get just just a start. So education, housing, health care, these basic fundamentals have become out of reach for a lot of people. And I know a lot of it is it's a fallout of the, of, the, of the Great Recession from you know 2008, and we're still kind of finding our way out of that. But those who were graduating college around, around that time, yeah. uh, it, it, I think those, those repercussions are, are real. And, and it's the kind of thing that a routine health problem, a routine traffic accident, say you've run into a bicyclist and all of a sudden you need to fix your car. And, and that because bicy- they're too cheap to do And the it. bicyclist is not going to pay for it, but also... Of course they wouldn't. They don't pay for anything. But, but also, you can't afford it either. Yeah. So now maybe you can't fix your car. Now maybe you can't get into your job. Now maybe you lose the job. You lose your health insurance. And, and there's this cycle of, of poverty. That There were some, some structures. Our, our institutions uh, would have been there in the past. And, and whether that's affordable college, that's specifically what I'm studying um, at, at Pitt, but also uh, something like just access to health care. Um, and then, of course, we're seeing the city of Pittsburgh. It's great that we have growth, but we're also seeing housing prices uh, increase at, at a pretty, pretty high rate. And so all these things that were just the, the, the things that you would need to really set yourself up in life are, are not there right now. Um, and I'm, I'm running. The, we, are, we are the first. I'm going to use collectively us in yeah. this room. We're the first generation that's not doing as well as our parents. And, and I have a three-year-old daughter, and I want to make sure that she does better than me. Sure. And, and you mentioned education. I know in Pennsylvania that's a huge issue uh, to go to a state-funded institution that, that gets taxpayer money uh, handed to it, it. It could be the same price as a private school here right, in right. Pennsylvania, given the amount of grants that they're able to get. So do you know, you maybe do know this, do you know that Pitt and Penn State are the two most expensive public universities? universities in the country. Yeah, wow. I do. Actually, the, I did even, not know that. It's even worse than that. It's the, the, the biggest uh, land grant. So even uh, even beyond if, if you know another institution has even just a grant right. of money that's been given to them, they're yeah more expensive. I think Penn State is number one and Pitt's number two. Is that correct? Or do I have that in reverse? Oh, I know last year, two years ago, it was the other way around, the but way they around. were within $500 yeah. each other. It's, it's pretty pretty uh, neck and neck there. Yeah, yeah. it's, in, it's yeah. insane. And, uh, and and they both, you know, they receive money as well as, you know, I went to, to Cal U, I could have went to St. Vincent for the same price, realistically. Uh, it's crazy. Right, right. And a lot of that goes back to the, the, the Governor Corbett era uh, cuts to education in the state on the state level. So there's, you know, the, our, our universities get state funding, they get federal funding, and then depending on the type of institution, obviously local or, you know, endowment funding, things like that. Um, and it was during the corporate administration where I was teaching at Shaler, um, where there were severe cuts to education budget across the board, K-12, mm-hmm. post-12, the whole, the whole bit. But to be fair, a lot of that was out of his hands because Ed Rendell did subsidize a lot of the state funding with federal one-time stimulus package money, to be fair. I, 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 do, I, I 
I, I think that there might be there might be some something there, but I also I recognize that Pennsylvania's education cuts were above and beyond mm -hmm. what was normal. And I think I think we're seeing that in the result of the pricing at, at Pitt and Penn State specifically. But but there is some I think there is a lot that we can do and, and a lot of it is just information to know what financial aid is available and how to get it. And that's that's the, the academic end of what, I'm, of what I'm researching. But but no, I do believe that post-12 education is going to be essential for anyone looking for a good job. And I don't necessarily mean a four-year degree, though if you can, you probably should. Mm -hmm. um, but that means some kind of formal training after high school uh, to, to prepare to prepare young people for those in-demand, high-paying jobs that, that we need. So how do you, when you go to Congress, plan to push for that agenda? What, what kind of changes do you think we need on a federal level to make post-secondary uh, education more affordable to people because we are in a, in a budget situation where right. we're, we're constantly overspending on a federal level. So how do we solve that? Is, is it cutting in other areas? Do, do we need new revenue sources in the federal government? There's, there's many things that we can do, and I think we need to look at college affordability specifically, or post-12 you know, education affordability, mm -hmm. uh, in two terms. One is what you're actually paying up front for it. So yeah, we can probably do something to subsidize tuition, or you know, if you qualify for other need-based programs, whether that's, um, I don't know, uh, I don't know, food stamps or, or other, other federal programs, You've already qualified. It's already on your taxes. You shouldn't mm -hmm. need to fill out another financial aid application form. You, the government already knows the information they need to know that you would qualify for this. Just check off that you've got someone in college, and now that you can get that money or be eligible for the money. The paperwork itself, in other words, the bureaucracy often eliminates a lot of eligible people from getting the help that they need. However, the affordability end of it is only one one part of it, you know, the actual cost. One of the best things we can do to make college or post-12 education a better deal is do more for the services to get kids to graduate. Because the big problem with student debt isn't those who go to school for six or eight years and graduate with six figures of debt, although that's concerning. Sure. They have six or eight years worth of education and probably are a lawyer or a doctor and are going to get the job that can pay that back. The biggest problem is those who start school don't have the supports that they need, take on a couple thousand dollars in loans, and never get then the degree that gets the job that pays back those loans. Yeah. And so I think what we I'm can do, what I we can do is, is do a lot more student services, a lot more to help students to graduate. I think that's the end of the student loan crisis that we don't talk about as much, is helping students get through college so they can get that job that gets that money to pay back that debt. So it's Affordability, sure, it's part of it, but it's also a matter of helping more kids to 40, 42%, 41% of people who start college finish. It's a very, very low number. Yeah. Uh, and I think we can do, do a lot more to address student loans by helping get those students the services they need to, to, to complete school in the first place. So you're running in the, the 12th district, and That's I know correct. you're you're going crazy because I know what it's like to run a campaign or, or be involved in a campaign. I've, I've done been involved in several myself. So uh, you're, you're doing that. You're a musician. You've got a child. You've got to be exhausted. Yeah, but it's but it's all it's all things I believe in. It's all things I love. Um, and, and the element of, of craziness in, in the 12th right now is is the redistricting thing that's going on. Um, so do you have a fear of being outside of the district once that happens? No, no, okay. uh, no. Um, I, I think that I think that the 12th to revisit, the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decided that the congressional boundaries will be redrawn by next month. And it's, it's exciting because somewhere like, I was saying here, we're here in Millville, and this is not in the 12th district. I live less than half a mile from here up the hill. I do live in You're the 12th in the district. district. Yeah. Um, and it is very, it's very possible that with those new lines, uh, something like Millville or Aetna Sharpsburg could all be part of that 12th. I would love to see something like that happen that's more fair representation. Um, and it's, it's exciting. It's exciting. You know, and I think that there was, there was great, great potential and great opportunity before this court ruling. I think my chances of winning have, have never been better. It's, it's great. very exciting. Yeah. And I think it's that prospect that kind of keeps all those balls in the air, but also with enthusiasm, with gusto, with, with enjoyment, yeah. Where would you consider yourself on the political spectrum? I think I'm a very, I want to say, uh, uh, reasonable or a pragmatic progressive. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's a lot of policies that um, make economic sense as well as are just the good thing to do. That might be high quality universal pre-kindergarten. Um, that, that, yeah, it's going to cost more money up front but it's a worthwhile investment, um, whether that's college affordability, whether that's expanded health care access. A lot of these things are, they're investments that 
come back many times over. And it's not just dealing with the the end of that. So when that same three or four year old you sent to a high quality preschool, 15 years later, gets into a better school or maybe gets a better job, gets a higher earning income, contributes more to the tax base, is less likely to have health problems, less likely to end up in jail, more likely to have healthy relationships. All this is borne out in, in a lot of evidence, but there's any number of things where the good thing to do is also the smart thing to do. And I think that's a, that's a really political sweet spot where you don't need to be a radical progressive to, to, I think, embrace those ideas. It's a very pragmatic way to look at good policy decisions. Now, do you have a background in politics before this? Have you been involved in any other campaigns or or run for any lower office? With organized labor, I've been involved in politics. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been my my uh, previous experience in, in the political arena. And so as a, I was a, a leader in the teachers union at Shaler, mm -hmm. um, and, and that, again, going back to the, the Corbett administration, uh, there was you know, uh, some pro-Corbett pro um, supporters on, on the school board who whose support for cutting education budgets I thought was really harmful. And, and we were able to to replace those, those board members. In 2015, the teachers at Shaler signed an early bird contract for the first time that anyone can remember. Uh, it, it made a huge difference. Um, and now I'm organizing with the graduate students at University of Pittsburgh under United Steelworkers to, to unionize as well. Okay. So that's, that's been very exciting as well. You know, we, we held a, a political action in December at Senator Toomey's office downtown against the um, taxing the tuition waivers that was, was part of that uh, tax agenda that, that didn't make it to the final bill. Um, but my, my political organization has, yeah, all been at the, the labor level. Uh, and I, I, I know that I know that unions are critical to keeping that middle class healthy. So this was this. I, I love I love this tidbit here. Um, I, I study a lot of research about social mobility, right? This idea that you can do better than the previous generation. Sure. Um, and and as an educator, that's really what my belief is that, that education is that on ramp to doing better, uh, having better prospects in life. And so I was not shocked, but I was surprised to see that that even a better indicator of your likelihood of Doing better than your parents economically is the strength of your local labor movement. Really? So even more important than great public schools is the strength of labor. And so it's, it's, it's vital, that, and there's no coincidence that as, as labor's been getting squeezed, we also see the middle class shrinking. Shrinking, sure. Yeah. No, I think that makes sense because the labor, when you're in a union, they do fight for higher wages and things like that. Um, do you think there's ever a, ch a chance that sometimes people will, or maybe a fear that individuals might get complacent in a labor setting and, and not advance further? Or do you think that being in that helps them, maybe gives them the finances to propel themselves forward? Yeah, I think it's, a, I think it's the latter one, but it's mm -hmm. also, it's, it's um, I, I think again and again, the mantra we come back to is, is, is labor defends a process, not a person. And mm -hmm. so if that person is not doing their job, there is a process to remove sure. that person, yeah. and and it's a the safety aspect of it as well as I think is incredibly important. So not necessarily you know for this uh, teaching That's or, or services, deal. but yeah. but for construction or or, or manual or um, the trades, uh, that that safety is a huge concern as well. And, and labor uh, and unions tend to do a lot for. You know, a better, uh, more safe. Work well, I think that that's a, a great point because you, you think of the way that the I, I went. I did a tour of Torred Mine. I don't know if you're familiar with Torred Mine. It's a an act. It's a previous mine that existed up in I think Torrenum. But you can actually go into the mine. They still have the mine set up. You drive the mine craft into the vehicle and they into the the mine and they show you different stages of mining oh, over cool. the years. And you could see this huge difference that that occurred after labor. Because before you would just go in there and whatever you could bring out that day, that's how much you made. So people's kids were in there uh, mining. It was it was grueling. It was very deadly. And even still, it's a very dangerous job. But without those unions, they would have still been, you know, just sending people in and wow, letting them example. fend for yeah, themselves. Yeah. So, oh, I should check that out. That's yeah, great. It's, a, cool. it's a great In tour. Toronto, huh? Yeah, I believe it's in Toronto. Awesome. Yeah, I used think, to work yeah. for uh, the company, one of the companies that would set up the Duke uh, University reunion gala when I lived in North Carolina. And we were part of a catering company, and we were not union. And this was like one of the few jobs annually each year where we were working along the side the rigorous union. And yeah, like our boss were trying to just like go up on scaffolding without harnesses and stuff like that. And the riggers were the ones who were like, you know, that if you're not wearing a, a harness when you're up there and you fall, they don't have to pay anything out They're like, okay. as long as you're wearing the harness even if it's between clicking or whatever uh if you fall you're you know insured and it was it was a lot of stuff like that where it's like these yeah these guys uh knew all kinds of stuff that we didn't and they made like twice as much as we did you mm -hmm. know 
So what is your knowledge of like foreign policy? What's, what's your background in foreign policy as, as an educator? So I've, right, I've traveled extensively myself. Okay. Um, I, in college, did, are you familiar with Semester at Sea? Have you heard the program? It used to be through Pitt. Uh, it's a shipboard education program where you're, you're on, they call it a floating university. And I was, okay. So, I didn't so know the name, but I've know, I know of the 2003 program. 2003 yeah. is when I did it. Actually, that same group of friends is were, were kind of uh, instrumental in, in in forming this campaign in the first place. Okay. Um, but it, but that was that was back in 2003, um, and it was circumnavigating the globe, taking courses as we went. Uh, since then, from 2009 to 2011, I lived in, in Riga, Latvia, and taught the International School of Latvia. And from there, traveled extensively. I've been to 40-something countries. So while it's not necessarily foreign policy per se, I have experienced a great deal of other other cultures, the way other things work. 2014 did field research in Zambia elementary schools throughout um, rural Zambia. Uh, and, and so I think that does shed a lot of light on what, what happens and what works in other places. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think certainly gears a lot, um, a lot of my inclinations towards towards diplomacy and towards towards uh, humanity and, and, and doing, you know, uh, good outreach internationally. Sure. How will you deal with all of that bullshit right. that's going on in right. Washington, D.C. It's ridiculous. Because it it's, not, it's, yeah. it's, it's like a bunch of children on both sides, really. Uh, I mean, you got the biggest kid in the White House, and then, you know, it just kind of runs Agreed. downhill. Agreed, and you're right on both sides. And I think that there's something, there's something also that's really interesting with this particular political movement right now, this moment of there are young people running for office all over the country and, and all kind of spontaneously and separate from each other. And I think mm-hmm. there's there's a real indication or, or um, signal for hope there as well that we don't harbor, I, I don't harbor those deep, deep-seated partisan divides. And I think there's a pragmatic youth movement that, that's coming up that, that can come together on things like infrastructure. We all agree that, that we can do something there or, or like being serious about opioids. We can be serious about something there. There's, there is a lot of room where we can work together. Um, and, and I think that young people, I, know, I mean, this has been shown as well in, 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 in research, the young people are not as, as driven to, um, I wanna say party loyalty rather than progressing policy. Uh, and I think there's real hope for that because yeah, it's, it's infuriating. It's infuriating, the gamesmanship that goes on. And then so much of it is, it, leaders of both parties have been in their positions, and this is the way we have it set up because you have to have seniority to have any re- a lot of real influence. However, um, right, we look to both sides, and it's for the large part the same faces for the past two plus decades. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, that, that yeah, we can certainly do with a lot of turnover on both sides of the aisle, and and I think this is this is one of those things that I think really speaks to to voters everywhere is frustration with gridlock and and these games and this childish behavior that. That we can, we have to do better. We we absolutely have to do better. And I'm 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 getting um, messages from people like people I do know from people I don't know or they, who they they know saying yeah. you know, my my friend's a lifelong Republican. They're they feel like they don't have a place right now, but they really want to vote for you. They've changed their party. Um, I called somebody the other day who's a, a staunch independent and and said uh, his thing was money and politics. I was like, oh, man, I I'm with you. Uh, as mm-hmm. as someone who's facing this pressure to always be raising money right now, it it really rigs the system against anyone who's relatively young has a job. Honestly, if I wasn't otherwise um, have a flexible schedule that I have with research right now, I couldn't be doing this. Uh, well, it it makes it so much pressure to raise money, and so it, it tilts the deck towards somebody who is either independently wealthy, retired, or uh, in, incredibly well connected politically. That. Anyway, I, I shared this guy's frustrations. He emailed me back right away and said, hey, I've changed my party registration from independent to dem- Democrat so I can vote for you. It sounds like you really have, have great hope here. And, and, and a lot of it comes down to money in politics because, again, those donors are also the most entrenched in their parties. Yeah. And, and so it kind of, it, it kind of comes down to, to campaign finance in the end. But, but that's all to say that there's great reason for great hope going forward. And, and I'm really, really optimistic that, that there is a change coming about. Well, how do you beat those big donors? Because that's the thing. It's kind of like right now they're pushing to shrink the size of the legislature on a local level in, in Pennsylvania. And that's something I applaud. I think we have, we, have the sec- we have the largest full-time legislature in the country, which is, is ridiculous. And they're voting to move that process along. But you have to like question, are they really going to do it? Because that's their livelihoods. You, you wonder these people... 
in Congress, I mean, maybe you get in there, but how are you going to convince all of these other people who are in the pockets of mega banks like, you know, Wells Fargo and, and you know, Goldman Sachs and right, companies and like that, the Koch brothers? How do you convince them that uh, the money's not worth it when that's how they've sustained their power for so many years? Uh, th those who are in office and who feel like that's where the, the money is and power is, I... I I don't need to convince them. The voters convince them by voting them out. I think that's what needs to happen. So someone like Keith Rothfuss sits on all the financial committees. He gets all kinds of money from banks and, 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 and different uh, financial institutions, not to mention all the, the, the big GOP donors that, you, that you've mentioned. And I think what's going to happen is people are voting, people are organizing, and it's happening across the country. And someone who was in a, quote, safe district, one that is so gerrymandered it's been ruled illegal, um, is vulnerable, and they're they're going to not they're not going to have their position come November, and so I think that there's they're not the ones I need to convince. I think it's it's voters who need to be convinced, and when mm -hmm. voters organize, when voters show up, and when voters use their right to vote, when they register to vote and vote every single uh, every single chance they get. It speaks volumes, and, and to be, that's that's the most persuasive thing. And to be fair, long term, long time Democrats like you know Chuck Schumer, or Hillary Clinton, and stuff get that money from the banks as well. It does cross across. Oh yes, uh, you know, yeah, both aisles. Yeah. And, and this was specifically that my that yeah. my opponent Keith Roth is yeah, is, oh, yeah. Is, is on those committees specifically. But yeah, you're right. You're right. It's 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 uh, that big money in politics is, is is a corrupting force on both sides. I don't take any comfort in knowing that someone like Nancy Pelosi has to be on the phone, calling and begging donors for money. As much or more than than I do. Yeah, I mean that's that's crazy. not comforting. That's 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 disturbing. Yeah, it's awful. Uh, you're welcome to stick around with us, Aaron. Uh, where can people find more information about you and your campaign? All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, you can find more information about the campaign at the website is AaronAnthonyForCongress.com. Our Instagram is just Aaron.Anthony. Twitter at AaronAnthony. Facebook slash Flip the Twelfth. Flip the Twelfth. That's what we're up, uh, out to do. Is flip this twelfth congressional district. Very so, cool. Uh, check it out. Hope you'll join us. Uh, please get in touch. This is a grassroots campaign, and it's it's an exciting thing to be part of. I do have one uh, one last question. That yes, sir. If you win, what happens with your role in the Cheerly Men who we just had on last week? <laughs> Because uh, it's going to be hard to keep driving That's back right. and forth from, from Washington. That's right. Uh, Congress is typically in session, what, Monday through Thursday? Our, our shows are typically Friday or Saturday nights. I hope we can still schedule a few shows right. uh, a few shows every few months. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw you all at, at Millville Music Fest last year. I was, I was hosting that uh, stage. Three. That's, That's right. right. Okay. That's, That's right. why you look familiar. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah up yeah, on that yeah. time. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It was really a great. Cool. It was a great event. Yeah. No. It's. I. I think I need that. That music outlet to keep me sane a lot of times. Yeah. 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 Well, that's Aaron Anthony, everyone. Uh, he is running in the 12th congressional district. Last year, we tried to get Keith Rothfuss on the show, but he was too afraid to sit across the table from Pittsburgh's moral compass. <laughs> So let's roll right along into the weird news. Aaron, you're welcome to stay with us if you'd like. If you've got to run, I understand. Gabe, you're welcome to join in on the weird news as well. But let's cue that music. Right. This is the River's Edge Radio Network. You're listening to River Talk. Michael Cohen, Brian Crawford here, and we are your only safety net against the Mon Monster who terrorizes the city each and every week. We will attempt to soothe the beast with not one, not two, but three weird stories. The first weird story is something that shocked me. I was shocked. Everyone is worried about climate change. Everyone's afraid of the, the planet getting warmer, and people are. some people are trying to take action. I know Michael, I'm certainly afraid. Yeah, you're afraid. So uh, how do you, what do you eat when you're at home? Oh, uh, mostly guacamole. Guacamole, okay. So he is saving the planet. There you go. <laughs> I am not, because I'm always on the run, and I, I microwave things. And a study came out in Europe that microwaves are emitting as much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as automobiles. Huh. Crazy. So I don't know what to do 
because people, you know, it's impossible to really live without a microwave if you have a busy schedule, if you're running a campaign, if you run a radio station, uh, a music festival, and work an overnight job <laughs> where you're working 40 plus hours a week. It's impossible to get by without a microwave. I don't know what the answer is. I can't, I'm certainly not going to go out into the backyard and use flint and steel and try to yeah, a toaster oven? get something is it, is going. It, is a toaster oven better? I don't know. I don't know. That's that stunned me though. They did a study, and so automobiles are slightly worse, according to this study. But it's really like neck and is neck. this like a microwave to a car, or it's like all the microwaves to all the cars? All the microwaves to all the cars. God so. damn. Yeah. So yeah, it's not one on one. It, it's like they compared the two, and and it was very close. I'm gonna pull up the story right here. And it, this came from... That is the kind of science story that would never make it out in the U.S. <laughs> no. So, well, it, it, it was reported by KDK. They uh, shared the story. It says, before turning on the microwave to reheat last night's dinner, a new report claims your common kitchen appliance is as big a threat to the environment as a gas-powered car. So the European Union, they totaled the microwaves at 7.7 .7 million... Uh, they, they released 7.7 .7 million tons of carbon dioxide each year. Which can be, which is about the same as automobiles, which is uh, actually it's more, which is a uh, six point eight million. So, I guess my question is, is so is that the actual microwave releasing it, or is it is that it uses so much energy? Oh, let's see. Like it's pumping it into my kitchen, or uh, at the other end of the plug. It's well, I think poisoning it's probably the microwave itself, because they're saying that, and this is what's crazy to me, and, and this is this is uh, maybe the difference between us and in Europe. Everyone's buying new microwaves because apparently appliances are fashionable. I've never considered an, an appliance fashionable ever. Like, like I would never go out and buy a new microwave when the old microwave's working because I wanted to be in style. Yeah, no, my Vitamix is like 25 years old. Exactly. So I don't know if maybe it is, it's an issue with the microwaves themselves. Maybe the microwaves that are being made are just cheaper. Hmm. I don't know. But it's, it's kind of stunning, I thought, uh, to hear this, that microwaves. I would never have thought of microwaves in the same sentence as global warming or climate change. Although you, now that you it. say them together, it, it definitely it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. All right. You have a story for us? Yeah. Brian, have, have you ever been in a porno? Of course. I mean, <laughs> you had to ask. Let's say you hadn't been in a okay, porno. Okay, never been in a porno. But you found out that there was pornography of you on the internet. Of me? Yeah. Like, your face. Okay. Yeah. How, how would that make you feel? Uh, it would make me feel like the sexiest man on the net. I would be, like, <laughs> pleasuring people worldwide because, I mean, who could not get enough of this? That's all I'm saying. Well, fortunately for you... Uh, a bunch of folks in a red in a subreddit called Deepfakes is using uh, machine learning and software that lets you scrape photos from people's. Uh, oh, so it's someone else's body, not my body. Oh yeah. Oh, so that would definitely not be good because it's your face. Yeah, it's my face. It's your on face, else's AI body. projected on the body. Oh, that's weird. Of a porn tape. That's really weird. Yeah. No, I mean. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to save lives here, not, yeah. not tear them this down. This is the, the great and glorious future that machine learning and AI are, are bringing to us is soon. That's crazy. Soon Everything turns into porn. Because I know, wasn't it when the... the it they, also turns into incriminating evidence in court, yeah. Sure, but wasn't that the case when it was Blu-ray versus HD DVD? It was. Which, which one you could watch better porn on? Yeah, or? I think that's what huh. made it, that's what made Blu-ray win is because the porn industry went with Blu-ray. Blu-ray won? Yeah. Yeah. O over what? Over the HD DVD. Oh, HD DVD. Okay. Yeah, I was yeah. like, no so, one has Blu-ray anymore. No, but they had won in that battle. Gotcha. There were two. It was kind of like... Uh, like, when like and that's why Laserdisc won. Like, Actually, okay. Laserdisc apparently is like a really good quality, though. No, but that's crazy. <laughs> now, so this happened to an individual? What? what? Uh, no, it's a whole subreddit full of them. Uh, and they're, they make celebrity ones. But then if you start digging... And you go into some other chat rooms that are associated with it. It's people uh, making it, ma making videos of their like high school crushes or like people at the office, right? Well, you you just go on someone's Instagram, right? You've got a hundred photos of them from various angles, and you pull that all down. You put it into the pro in, into various programs, and yeah, it, it projects. It, it covers so weird. the face. Yeah, 
That's it seems kind of like like desperate almost like you want to be with that person but that you can't i don't know and so you produce fake revenge porn of them and then i guess i could see where that would go we talked about the sex robots in a pre i don't think that was an episode you were on that was with jay and howie but we talked about the the sex robots and that's a situation where i guess you could put that person's image on the sex robot that's just weird it's it's very i don't like that part of the future I think that's most of the future. All right, what you got? All right. Uh, The third story has to do with an interesting uh, funeral where a chicken, a Texas chicken, has received an honor few, if any other birds get, a a formal obituary. Huh. So a paid death notice for Big Mama, a six-year-old Rhode Island red, appeared appeared on Tuesday in the Eagle newspaper, which is based out of Bryan, Texas. Just to be clear, having raised chickens, that is a very old chicken. Yeah, that's a that's a yeah, it's an old old chicken. It says not many chickens deserve an obituary, but she does. Wrote Big Mama's human family, and it has the obituary here. It says it is with sadness that we report the passing of our all-time favorite chicken, Big Mama. Not many chickens deserve an obituary, but she does. Big Mama came into our lives in September 2013. A family friend told us about a chicken who has been spayed, raised alone in a Houston apartment and then taken to a veterinarian to be euthanized after the family grew tired of it. That vet was a graduate of Texas A&M College of Veterinary Medicine, and instead of euthanizing her, had her owner relinquish the rights so Big Mama could be adopted. So this is an adopted chicken. So I think it's kind of cool to have a, an obituary for, for a chicken. I wonder if they threw a funeral. Right, because funerals can be intimidating. And, and expensive. It's, it's important that you have them in a place that you feel comfortable with. Comfortable, treated well. Somewhere like Han's funeral home, the only family-owned funeral home in Millville. I imagine that they would take care of your pet and give your pet all of the pomp and circumstance that it deserves in its final days. Your pet deserves a green funeral, and not all funeral homes have those. Not all all funerals. But Han's does. Yeah, they specialize in the green burial. So uh, if if your pet croaks, take it to Han's. So that is the, the weird news. We've got Gabe Reed with us here in studio. How are you today? I'm good, Brian. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. There we go. Okay. Good, good. Glad to have you. So you have a big show at Stage AE. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, i got a show coming up. I'm working with uh, uh, Pioneer Records. I just Hold got it real close to your mouth. Uh, can there you we go. Now? That's better. Yeah. Right, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm working really close now with Pioneer Records. I just got signed earlier this year. So How did that go? That's great. Yeah. How did that happen? So basically... Um, Signs, they sign one artist per year. Um, only one per year? Only one I didn't per know year. that. Wow. And it's great what they do. I get to work with Jesse Noss at Red Cayman Studios, and he's a phenomenal producer and sound engineer. And basically, uh, I get to work with a great team, a marketing team. I get a producer. Uh, I'm working with Ed Travisari, who uh, is very well known in Pittsburgh for producing shows around here. He did John Mayer, Bob Marley, a lot of those shows uh, back in the day. Um, so I'm working very, very closely with them, and um, how it happened was basically you submit three songs, and um, mm-hmm. then there's a panel, and a lot of them are students, um, and basically the panel of judges, um, I, I got all ones across the board, which is the highest. The highest you can get. And so then they had this huge ceremony where they kind of tricked me into coming to this place, <laughs> uh, and they surprised me with this great, awesome big sign and everything, so you're the next Pioneer Star, which is pretty awesome, and it was such an amazing feeling and I'm very grateful that that happened to me um, and so now basically what we're doing is uh, I'm working with my band and uh, we're working on an EP that's going to come out so what's your band because I've never seen you perform in a band I've only ever seen you as a solo performer right well I am a solo performer I, I write all the music myself um, and then I have a band in the studio with okay. me now they're hired musicians so and they're you know phenomenal musicians um, and it's such an humbling opportunity to work with uh, other great musicians that really make my art come to life to life sorry and um, so basically what we're doing now is um, it's great because um, I get complete artistic control over over the EP and what it's gonna sound like what it's gonna be called and um, what we're doing now is we're recording uh, we're gritting all the songs basically which is uh, we're creating a map for uh, all the different songs that I'm doing, which there's going to be four songs on the Chasing Gray EP, which is coming out, um, it's coming out April 13th, and that's actually the date the uh, release party's at Stage AE, and then later. What date uh, was that again? April 13th. Okay. Yeah, 
And um, and then on in May, I'm playing with Chasing the Barons at um, actually here at Mr. Smalls. Okay, um, in the main stage of the Funhouse or Funhouse, fun house. awesome, yeah. very cool. It's nice because we can uh, we could see it from this window, which yeah, is kind great. of cool. Yeah, yeah. So that's cool. So this is exciting. This is this is a, it was a big change for you. I know a lot about Pioneer Records. I've I've worked with them in the past, and they yeah. do a great job. Everything that they do is 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 fantastic. And how has that helped you as a musician being associated with them? Honestly, I, I have learned so much about the industry and about how everything works, how everything kind of molds together. Mm-hmm. Um, like, for instance, Ed Travisari had me uh, talk to John Esposito, who's the vice president of Warner Brothers Music. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, I got to talk to him. I got to sit down and pick his brain, how, how people get places. And it, it is very hard to be in the music industry today just because you kind of have to be pulled up. It's, uh, you know, the music industry is this big bubble of social media and sometimes bad pop music. And then you have to be kind of pulled up into that bubble and you have to get recognized by someone bigger um, just because everything is based mainly on mainstream top 50, top 100 charts. Um, unless, you know, you're a local artist, which you can build a local following, which is what I'm trying to do now here in Pittsburgh, which I've had some luck with because I, I go to school at Point Park and yeah. I have a lot of friends and supporters that come to my concerts. And uh, You do bring a crowd. That's one thing that's awesome about you when you go out and <laughs> perform. You do have a, a group of people to follow you around, yeah. which is pretty cool. Yeah, my friends are very supportive of my music, which is, uh, that's all I can ask for as an artist. So I remember I was at an open mic and that's when I first met you. You were, actually, I didn't, officially meet you yet i met you later but the first time i saw you perform was at the Hambones open mic which is on tuesdays yeah and you went up onto stay onto the stage and there was like a cheering section that was cheering <laughs> around you and i thought what the hell is this an open mic and he's got a, a cheering crowd with him yeah and it, and it was pretty great because it, it was fun it added some excitement to the open mic yeah. but you don't often see that or, or really ever see that at an open mic you have you know people who cheer and clap and, mm-hmm. and things like that but these were all people who weren't either they weren't musicians or they weren't performing at the time they just were there to see you yeah i'm very fortunate to have uh like a following that i do have right now and i'm continuing to build that following especially with pioneer records they're helping me a lot because you know the one problem i was running into when i was doing all this myself and i was going and i was performing using bunch of pedals loop machines and everything uh was that i was not very good at marketing myself marketing myself was my one weakness because you know i'm not really on facebook instagram too much and you know they've helped me my marketing team has really helped me delve into that side of the industry which is hugely uh influential on the listeners because when you're constantly updating and 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 it's great because my marketing team can also help me do that and it's all word of mouth like it's I, I tell them what to say but and stuff but like a lot of times I'm busy doing gigs or um, that they can help me with that and they can teach me how to do that so um, do you think they'd be willing to come and help the rivers <laughs> yeah <laughs> I do really go to Facebook but man I release an EP Brian maybe, you'll get some maybe, that, maybe that'll be it yeah I'm, I mean I'm horrible at Instagram I'm horrible at, I don't even have a snapchat for, yeah for my the Instagram network. is just is, is most of it is screenshots of the like promotional stuff that I do on Facebook, yeah, you, that would be you trimmed and then just stuck over. It, it, I, I have like two Instagrams a month. At least it, I don't do that. So you know what I do on Instagram, and, and what's made me successful on Instagram is Probably I literally doesn't have anything to do with porn. Well, of course. Yeah. How do you think we got our numbers? I literally go and steal everyone else's pictures because they tag me in it. And there's an app that you can get on your phone where they literally just re Instagrams everybody else's Instagram and it quotes them so it says you're, you're not technically stealing it says this post was by so and so but it's about the network they post me I just re Instagram uh, yeah, it yeah, yeah. and then I get all of these likes <laughs> and it works because the person who Instagrammed it they know what they're doing on Instagram so I is it redoes all of their words and everything I know I sound like an old man talking about Instagram because I have no idea what the right vocabulary is because I just don't do it that often and then the Twitter We've got two Twitter accounts. The one does really, really well, and that's the River's Edge list, which mm-hmm. is the playlist. But the the Twitter account that's the actual River's Edge, it, it's a similar thing where I'm like, eh, I don't post that much. It's just yeah. I don't see the traffic that you know warrants my energy. Yeah. So I, that would be wonderful to have. I that could team. use more followers on Twitter, but my my ratio is hot. My ratio is not hot, you and I, mean? I also <laughs> I'm also afraid to to try to try to get more followers because somebody told me once that you could pay for followers, 
And I said, really? Oh, they're not real. They're bots. They're bots yeah. well, that's what they said. I, I asked them. I said, well, will they actually watch the, the shows and listen <laughs> to the network? And they said, no. I, so I said, what the hell's the point of the, people liking my Twitter account to do nothing with oh, it? Well, the, the point is, is because people are sheep and they need to be shown that other people support you before they'll take you seriously. Yeah. Which is crazy. Come on, Brian. I was that's just actually... I was talking about that earlier. I mean, uh, yeah. people are, a lot of the millennials generation, they, they get so sucked into their phone and that's their self-confidence. And then they just see a number on their Instagram and that that gives them more confidence you know what I mean? yeah it's Number crazy gives, well gives I was confidence to move forward and actually yeah I mean I, I mean like, b before I still don't know if anyone actually comes to see me perform comedy but when I'm on a show I always promote it partially just so that people know that I get booked a lot you know so that they see well, I and, think and, you and should then, and, well, and then they know that I'm someone to book because but to me that's different than paying for followers though well, it, it that's is. That's important, and, and that actually is, is valuable to me. So I was on a discussion panel with other big shots in the Pittsburgh area. I was, I was invited, <laughs> given a personal invitation uh, at WYEP, actually. So I, I went to, so a, to a different network. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, was, I was one of a, of a select few that was invited. So it wasn't like it was just all me. I was, one of, I was actually one of three people who, who were invited, and then I, I brought a guest to come with me. And it was a discussion panel on booking musicians. And we were talking about social media. And one of the people on the panel, Cody Walters, who runs the Deutschtown Music Festival, said that he looks at people's Facebook likes and, and stuff like that to see you know, how big they are or whatever. And somebody like in the audience said something uh, about that. And I said, well, I think what he's meaning to say is that you don't, and I, and I think he agreed with me, it doesn't, you don't have to have the most likes, but if you have like, 50 likes on your Facebook page, are you really trying? And I think that that does show something. I don't yeah. think you have to have like thousands it. of likes, but if you don't, if you haven't put no work into it at all, right. My, are you taking well, yourself seriously as an, as an entertainer? Great, uh, like social media is a great tool to get your stuff out there. Yeah. Because there's so many that, uh, it gives you so many connections everywhere. So I think as a musician and from like the River's Edge radio station, you know, that's really important to have to update it and to have that amount of likes because this is also like a business. You're running a business and social media is a way to run your business, you know. And yeah. so I sometimes the line gets blurred of whether or not uh, like people people who aren't running a business that are just using it for pleasure that those amount of likes matter to them. Like to me, yes, um, the amount of likes I it does matter to me just because uh, you know I'm trying, to, I'm trying to yeah I'm trying to build a fan <laughs> yeah. base. And sure, I'm yeah. To, uh, but I think quality yeah. likes matter more than just somebody clicking on something if they're not going to pay attention oh, to your no, you're content wrong. does yeah. it right. no you're wrong i know i'm wrong in the <laughs> world but to me personally the, the algorithm I, brian the algorithm I know. well the <laughs> algorithms are changing too that's another thing how do you how do you factor that in as as a musician with the algorithms changing on facebook <laughs> no it's a serious question i'm not very good at math brian i know we're all out of our league at this <laughs> well, point it's not it's not math it's about knowing what facebook looks for so now Facebook is, is trying to, to show you more things that your friends and family do. So do you plan on using your personal Facebook page as a tool to try to, to drive traffic? Because that's one thing yeah, that I, mean, I do a lot with this network because, honestly, if I just post it as the river's edge, especially with the way the new algorithm is going to be, that's not going to be effective. Whereas if I share it on my personal page and, mm -hmm. and tag a bunch of people, that's going to get bigger numbers. Yeah, and that's what Pioneer Records is kind of teaching me right now is to use my music page a lot more. Like I'm trying to... Uh, veer um, audiences toward my music page to build that base but then I'll share it on my normal page so people who know me like my family and friends yeah. they'll, they'll see that and then like I'm trying to build that following too so I mean I think it's important to, to have both I think um, especially to keep in contact like my family lives a long way away so like I think that's a good way to post pictures and they can see how I'm doing and, and all that but there's, there's also like now I'm, I'm becoming more successful in the music industry and so now i have to veer more towards uh like my other page for strictly music stuff and because before it was like i'm doing this for fun i haven't had much success but now i got to take it seriously and that pioneer records is really helping me do that what opportunities do you think you're going to get in the future being with pioneer records i mean they've already given me so much opportunities free recording i get all the all the money that i make off my ep um, that's awesome the huge uh, ep release 300 cds um i'll be selling it at stage ae that night um um other than that i mean once you're signed to pioneer records you're signed to pioneer records so it's um 
they basically are going to help me find gigs. Hopefully, hopefully I'll book a tour this summer, maybe. Um, and if not, I'm also an actor. I'm, uh, I get to, I'm at a New York showcase this semester. Where I get to go to New York and perform on Broadway nice. um, in front amazing. of a bunch of New York agents. And then hopefully I'll get signed to an agent there. And so, Wow, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Very cool. Well, when you get the EP released, be sure to talk to us. We'll get it in rotation definitely. for you here definitely. at the River's Edge. Uh, let's have you play a song. Definitely. definitely. And then yeah. we're going to discuss uh, one more topic that's important to me and then we'll uh, we'll let you play one more song to to wrap it up so awesome. let's uh can i steal your mic uh, that, go for it go for it okay uh, you want to mute your channel while we position it so uh we'll, we'll get a couple songs in here and this is gabe reed who just got signed to pioneer records so, which is fantastic and he's got a song for us what, what are you going to sing for us i'm going to sing uh, the single off my ep uh right now it's called take a note all right so, um, you just gonna hold this? Yeah, I'll hold it for you. <laughs> okay. Alright, um, how's the levels on the guitar? Uh, test, 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 one, two. Alright, here we go. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Down to the kids like it's fucking phonics. Oh, my dad told me keep your feet on the ground. Life's a lost and found. People will come around, but I'm impatiently waiting for motivation to kick. And I'm picking hundreds of words, but nothing seems to be sticking. My instability is my insecurity. I worry that maturity is something that I carry like an idea. Pull it out just to show you that I can. Fill up the shoes to what it means to be a man. And what do you gotta say to me? I already don't know. Don't know. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
All right, Gabe Reed, right here on the River's Edge Radio Network. It's his uh, first time here in the studio. We've been trying to make this work for a while, so I'm glad that we got this uh, this going. So, again, that is uh, April, you said 13th, correct? April 13th at Stage AE for his EP release. And I'm hoping when I get there, I don't have a, a, a negative experience with the seating. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is, is we were here, we, we were in studio, Zach and I, we're, we're going over some, some business things, and I'm out there, uh, I'm eating a sandwich, I'm talking with him, and then I can't remember why, but I reached under the seat, and, and we're very grateful that all of the stools here we, we have were provided by Mr. Smalls for us, these big bar stools, but it is a concert venue, people go there, and these assholes stick gum underneath the seat. I go to reach, and somebody's like, used food <laughs> touched my hand, so I had to run for the hand sanitizer. <laughs> That is what you would do. It's horrible. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's like uh, body fluids. Did you ever think how weird it is? Like, like people will pick their nose. They're like throwing parts of their body out <laughs> into nature. Did you ever think about that? It's like part of your body is, is out there, right? Well, it's kind of like oh, that with the you're going to really like, freak out when I tell you about this thing called death. <laughs> well, I already have plans for that. It's Hans funeral home. <laughs> <laughs> but man, you know, when you stick under your chair and you feel that gum, like w what is the appropriate punishment for someone who does that? It's it's got to be bad for nature, right? Gum being it's not bad for nature. How is gum not bad for nature when it's attached <laughs> to things that it shouldn't be attached to? And then you could like walk down the the road and you see like gum prints <laughs> on the floor. There's gum under the chair. Like people, you know, people talk about this flu epidemic. That's how you get a flu epidemic is by sticking your goddamn gum under the chair. So are you worried about this at my gig? Is that, is that <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm hoping that they de-gum all of the chairs is what I'm saying. Right. Well, actually, people will be standing. It's more of like... Oh, it's a standing it's event. A standing okay. Event. There's going to be a lot of college kids. So. Okay, great. So no gum. And, and I don't feel like kids anymore chew gum. Do kids still chew gum? Do you well, chew gum? I think it's a better God. alternative than smoking cigarettes. So. I don't... Well, you know, it depends. If you put your cigarette in one of those re repositories, uh, then then, it's, then I would agree. But if you're just flicking them around the, the ground, then it's the same as the gum. But at least they disintegrate, whereas the gum is there what? forever. Like, this gum outside of this bench, this, this, this stool has been in this studio for at least six months, and the gum is not disintegrated. It's still there. It's still living in clinging to the bottom of that chair. I think we should start recycling gum, Brian. I think we need to start chewing. It doesn't it take long. It doesn't take much gum. effort to keep the gum wrapper in your pocket. <laughs> then you can throw it into the, the gum wrapper, and then when you get to a trash can, throw it away or swallow the gum or, or do something. Don't stick it on the bottom of a chair. Like It's like we're animals. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Gabe? Since you seem Actually, to Brian, you'd be interested to know, humans are actually the only animals that stick gum on the bottom of the chairs. That's true because we're worse than <laughs> we're worse than rats in that regard. At least they, you know, we're worse than dogs. At least dogs eat their own feces. <laughs> we just thumbs. we yeah, we just throw 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 shit everywhere. So you Raccoons seem to have them too. How do you feel about <laughs> how do you feel about this gum situation? How do you feel about the gum situation? I I want to know what what is the appropriate punishment for someone who litters the earth with gum? Oh uh, well, I'm I'm actually um, you're a gummer. I'm not a gum. I don't chew gum, but don't I'm chew gum. also okay. not a neurotic germaphobe. So it's a little from column A, a little from column B. I don't B. think I'm a neurotic germaphobe. <laughs> I just think that spreading disease is a bad thing. I think spreading pollution is a bad thing. This is polluting the world. That's one thing I like. I went to Islands of Adventure once, mm -hmm. and it was great. There was no debris on the floor at all. You could literally, and I did because my shoe, my feet were killing me. So I took off my sandals and I just walked in my bare feet at Islands of Adventure in Florida. Aaron Anthony just quietly retreated from this conversation out of the studio. I, actually, I would like to see what his, I, I should have asked him what, what he would have thought as far as policy decisions. Because I want to know what steps can we take to clean up the world from gum. Probably why he bounds. He, uh, this is this is this not is a an hard, issue one wants to weigh in on. In this public. is a tough issue. This, this is like the weekly. I think we need to start swallowing gum. I, swallowing gum. That's okay. the only. I mean. But what if somebody does litter? Balance, how do you? What is the appropriate punishment for a gum for a gummer? Somebody who gums. 
I, I intentionally didn't ask him about the weed issue because that's like that's 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 the death question for politicians this I year. I should have asked him that, but you know, I, I no, why? We like him. I like him. You don't Doesn't have to matter. Like him. You're objective or something, but I I, I like him. Well, I like him. He's a good guy, but yeah. you know, if you're going to vote for him, you're voting for him on the issue. So I think it is an important topic, but. I, I thought what we asked I thought was was more germane to his background. Yeah, and, totally. No, yeah. A, a, absolutely. So, what, where what do you think the appropriate punishment is for a gummer? What's uh, what do they do in sticking those Asian gum countries every- where they take the the cane and whack you with it a couple times in public? <laughs> that's an idea. <laughs> I like that. Caning. Um, oh, do you think that's we should- so bad to people? Yeah, don't litter. Exactly, it's bad to litter. You're spreading disease. You could kill someone with your germs. Yeah, it's like I, biological warfare. Every concert venue, every like park bench, there's biological warfare. People trying to kill the elderly. They hate the elderly. They're putting gum under because they know they've got disease. The trying elderly to thin the it. herd. Well, well, I think that people <laughs> who stick gum in inappropriate places should be detongued. Watch them try to chew gum without a tongue. I think you can do that. Yeah, I think that's still possible. Yeah, we gotta remove the well, teeth. Well, you use yeah, you, the, you gotta take their teeth. No, but Brian. you do use your tongue when you are when you're gumming, like when you're chewing gum. <laughs> also, that's do. not what gumming means. Gumming is already a verb, and it means something really different. It, it also well, involves removing the teeth. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> My grandmother used to gum. <laughs> she didn't have any teeth, and she would walk around without teeth. What did she gum, Brian? Uh, everything. <laughs> so. I don't know. Do you think that's an extreme punishment? I think it's reasonable. I think the punishment should fit the crime. Yeah, I don't know. I think we should... I think for first-time accusers, first-time offenses, I think we should just give them a break. But then uh, I think for... Maybe if they do it three or four times... Maybe the least... cane idea is a good idea. Just you know, a little pat. <laughs> there should at butt. least be a fine yeah. on the first offense. I don't know. Like a $20 fine? Because you got to pay somebody at $20 an hour to walk around and ungum things. I think there should be, um, uh, you know, all the different responses you can put on Facebook. I think there should be a picture of a piece of gum. And if you know that someone is a gummer, you can go on Facebook and react to their posts with a piece of gum. That's a good idea. Well, so basically, you're calling them out. It's kind of like the scarlet letter type of a deal. It's Pu- on their face. Pu- Sh- everything else is is beholden the call out culture at this point. Why not gum? Well, I think that's a big <laughs> issue. I've called people out on not washing their hands in the bathroom before. I was in line, so I was at Sheets the one day, and I'm going to the bathroom, and this guy walks out. He doesn't wash his hands. Hey, we're going to be done in a minute here. <laughs> we we were five minutes late getting started. So gone. All right. Don't let me stop you. This guy walks out of the bathroom. He doesn't wash his hands. And I said, he didn't wash his hands. I was stunned. I shouldn't have been stunned because people are dirty bastards. So then I go to check out my food at at the, the gas station. And this guy's in front of me. And I'm like, he didn't wash his hands. Actually, the better story is the one time I was at the dance club. I'm at the dance club, okay? It's a, a, a pearl. It's a champagne bar. Sure. We're there. Same thing happens. I wash my hands. This other guy doesn't wash his hands. We're back out there. I'm sitting with my friends, and I see him dancing with this girl. And I told my friends, I said, he didn't wash his hands. <laughs> oh, my God. And they said, well, why don't you go tell You're her? You're insane. So, so I did. I walked up. I said, you know, he didn't wash his hands. Oh, my God. Brian. And I walked back, and I saw him hauling his ass back to the bathroom. I saved someone from, like, a cold or something because that guy washed his hands. You're in hysteria. Because it's fine. that girl wasn't going to dance with him with unwashed hands. Good. So, yeah, I'm saving the world one glass of champagne When you do that to at me, a time. I'll just tell her that you're, you're wrong and you're crazy and I'll deny no. How is that? Uh, because you're, you're saying that you did wash your hands. Why would you? I, I would just month. lie at that point. Yeah. But why wouldn't you just wash your hands in the first place? You would save, all, you would save yourself the embarrassment maybe, of being an unwashed person. Maybe I didn't piss on him. It doesn't I mean, matter. If, you if, still if you piss on your you hands. You still touched your to... unmentionables. You need to to some wash your hands good, after that. I, that. I some germs are good, and I probably washed that this morning. Okay, but that doesn't so, mean you don't you don't wash again. You, you always there's a reason why there's signs inside of employment uh, places that say wash your hands for 20 seconds with hot water. Maybe we should put scolding water in the mouths of those that gum <laughs> across God. this country. That way, they you know they would learn their lesson. I think that's that. That might be a winner. You agree with that? Whatever. Yeah. Uh, he, he agrees with it. So there we go. You, you're you're on my side too. 
All not right. so much. But All right. Well, two against, on. two against one. <laughs> we are going to save the world. That, that, that's why the world, I think, is coming to an end. It's because we're gumming. All over the place. Do you have one more song for us? Heck yeah. Alright, let's do one more song. And then we're gonna wrap up. So we're gonna we're gonna end with Gabe here tonight. This is the last uh, song, last piece of River Talk. It's been fun. I feel like it's been forever since I've done this show. It's only been one week, but it's been a long, long week. I've been threatened <laughs> twice in, in, a, in a short time. I've uh, I've, I don't know. It's just been, it's just been a long, sleepless week. So I'm, I'm glad to, to get this week rolling. Glad to be back in studio. I'll be back right before, so probably on a Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. I'll be back in studio with the Millville Music Minute. I'll be here with a groundhog talking about the upcoming groundhog party that we're having at Panza Gallery. That's going to be on February 3rd. It's going to benefit the Millville Music Festival, which the submissions will end on the 31st. So please, if you have not submitted yet, do so at millvillemusic.org. For Michael Cohen, thanks to Aaron Anthony. For Zach Fell behind the board, thanks to Gabe Reed as well. I am Brian Crawford. This is River Talk. We will catch you on Saturday at 10 a.m. right here on the River's Edge. This one's called Seams. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Can't wait to be back on. Um, buy my EP when it comes out. It'll be called Chasing Gray. Time is broke, your arm goes, your hands and down goes my eyes. I'm so if I'm token, please on me, I'm choking. Tongue tight, open up for you. Holding in my hope and open any coping mechanism to deal with awkward thoughts. The sound of you in your voice call you instead of backwards. Never know your back curves, feel the bees and darkers. Feel my tongue up in time. When will I learn? They say the distance makes the heart grow under. So I packed my love up, set my lungs to wander. My heart is breaking like the same. Giving it all to an altar in your dreams. Making love in twin size beds, hear the knock, knock, knock. It's time to pay the rent. It's been waking me up at night. So when my kids say good yes, so is there a bucket list and pick a yes ho? Tell me what's the right path to pick when they're both cold. Do I keep eating from my hand and want so me? These ideas of a perfect life, one wife, one bite, one place, and only one dream to chase. Erase these images out of your mind and follow the signs of your heart being now. Oh, I never slow down, but I'm not in a hurry. I got a bitch who status come at you, hoping I'm worthy. My muscle mass is like a noodle, I know. Your mind your body to the beat of the flow Do you wanna love or just somebody to hold? Cause I could be both cocoon up in your life You need a break when I call love or love somebody Draw somebody, confess to me who you are Use me as Turning your dreams Make a love in twin size bed To the knock, knock, knock It's time to pay the rent It's been waking me up at night So am I getting sick of just so? Is there a bucket list to pick a just ho? Tell me what's the right path to pick when you're both cold Do I keep eating fun of anyone so me? These ideas of a perfect life One wife, one bite, one place And only one dream to chase Erase these images out of your mind And follow the signs of your hobby now Take another, take another, take another hit Will it pass, will it pass, will it pass quick Take another, take another, take another hit Will it pass, will it pass, will it pass quick Take another, take another, take another hit Will it pass, will it pass, will it pass quick Take another, take another, take another hit Get it was
is here so you can continue where you left off Making it rain serotonin just to feel us alone And you gotta find another way to feel invincible You gotta hold another truth to know it's lies You gotta taste another drink to feel confident You gotta break another heart to know the lies So am I getting sick of just so? Is there a bucket list I kick of just so? Tell me what's the right path to pick when you're both cold Do I keep beating from my hand? So no ideas of a perfect life One wife, one bite, one place And only one dream to chase Erase these images out of your mind Follow the signs of your heart be numb